No part of the following lecture material may be used without the express written consent of Rick Ramos or Contra Costa College. Hi, this is Professor Rick Ramos, and we are in Adjust 221, Legal Aspects of Evidence. Topic for today's lecture is relevancy. Way back in Chapter 1, we talked about the fact that there were three things that uh, were necessary. There were three tests for the admissibility of evidence, and they were relevant, that it was competently presented, and that it was legally obtained. So today we're going to talk about uh, relevancy. And first of all, let's define relevancy as it relates to evidence. And it is that evidence has a tendency to prove or disprove any disputed fact that is a consequence to the disputed action, meaning that um, it can prove or disprove whether or not somebody committed a crime in the instant case before the court. Common areas of relevant evidence include motive. Motive is the, mo motive is the moving cause or reason why the crime was committed. Motives include revenge, financial gain, sexual gratification, jealousy, personal animosity or hatred, addiction or gang affiliations. Examples, California's hate crime statute prohibits harassment, intimidation, or force directed toward persons or property motivated by hostility towards ethnic background, national origin, religious belief, sex, age, disability, or sexual orientation. Evidence concerning the possession or expenditures of large amounts of money is relevant when the defendant is charged with a crime where the motive is financial gain. So if you find that someone was spending $1.5 million in cash, cash to purchase a jet airplane, that might show why they stole money or why they were uh, selling cocaine. In a particular case called U.S. v. Wood in 1990, the cash was brought to an aircraft dealer in three duffel bags with, with testing positive for traces of cocaine. Spending $100,000 to refurbish the plane with cash and checks drawn on a Cayman Islands bank account and the registration application for the jet contained false information. These different factors lead someone to believe that the motive is to make large financial gain through cocaine distribution. The next area of relevant evidence is capacity to commit a crime. Capacity is one's mental ability to form intent, wrongfully act, or understand a legal duty imposed by the law. Under some legal circumstances, a person lacking capacity cannot be held criminally responsible for one's actions, and one of those would be insanity. Evidence bearing on the capacity or lack of capacity to commit a crime is relevant when deciding whether or not to file criminal complaint charges against someone who might be considered an idiot or a child who's under 14 years of age. Now, the bottom line is, is the law looks at the individual determine whether or not they could form criminal intent in their mind. The typical capacity areas in criminal evidence include children under 14, because in California, if a child is under 14, they're presumed to be incapable of committing a crime in the absence of clear proof that they knew the wrongfulness of their act, and that's under 26 of the Penal Code. This is a rebuttable presumption. Now, remember, rebuttable presumption is we take this, the pres presumption on its face unless you can prove through evidence that it's wrong. Before a minor can be legally be held responsible for committing a crime, the prosecution has a burden of proof to show the knowledge of the wrongfulness. In um, 2000, or, or early 2000, there was a case where an eight-year-old and a five-year-old broke into a house or went into a house that was unoccupied or the parents were not around to steal a bicycle. and they came upon an infant who was in a crib, and they tossed the infant onto the ground and kicked it around like a basketball, causing a, a concussion. Now, the child survived, but, but suffered some mental problems. In that case, the judge refused to charge either of the children with a crime, even though the district attorney was adamant about charging, because they couldn't show that the children knew the wrongfulness of their actions. So when we talk about idiots, this is a person who's without uh, mentality and lacks the ability to form criminal in intent or understand the duty imposed by law. So it's real similar to a child. If you have someone who has the mind of a child, if we're saying we can't prosecute a child because they don't have the capacity 
to determine wrongfulness, then that also continues when we start the discussion about other uh, characteristics of persons, including idiots. The legal test that determines an idiot is the same as a legal test for insanity for the purposes of criminal responsibility. The next area is insanity or mental illness. Persons who are found insane at the time of committing a crime can be judged not legally responsible for their actions. This is a defense to a crime. And if you could look under, I'd like you to go uh, to the virtual penal code or pull out a penal code, look up PC-26. You're going to need it for the midterm, and it has all the defenses to crimes. Uh, one of the cases that you'll hear about is the McNaughton case. But in People v. Skin, the defendant carries the burden of proof to show that due to a mental deficiency or disorder, he or she was unable to distinguish right from wrong at the time of the commission of the crime. And they were incapable of knowing and understanding the nature of one's act. In a case called People v. Bolo, Bobo, Bobo uh, was a victim of a delusional and psychotic condition. The defendant stabbed their, her three children who were eight months to six years of age and set her apartment on fire. She maintained that she killed her children to protect them from a perceived worse fate by others. District Court uh, of Appeals ruled that the defendant's mental state did not automatically negate a finding of malice. Expressed malice for murder can be, still be proven even though the crime was committed by a mentally ill person. Evidence of planning, motive, and method of operation established unlawful, unlawful intent to kill. So a person could be crazy, but if they're able to premeditate, we could still charge him with a crime. I mean, heck, look at Jeffrey Dahmer. This guy was eating folks, right? But he planned how he would seduce people and get them into his house. He also knew of the wrongfulness of his act because he used to keep bones as trophies. And he hid those so people wouldn't see them. If he was totally nutso, uh, in my opinion, he would have just displayed those for everyone to see. The next category is voluntary intoxication. In People v. Valdez in 85, the appellate court said basically, if you're going to smoke that weed, you're responsible for whatever it's laced with. So if it's laced with PCP or some other type of, of um, drug that's going to make you do something crazy, then uh, you take that responsibility on because it's your responsibility to maintain the gift of reason. Now, I happen to know as a young person in junior high school going to a party and someone had told me ahead of time, do not drink the punch uh, because somebody had laced it with LSD. Thank God they told me that. But a, I remember that one student kind of went crazy, took a knife, stabbed somebody, jumped through a window. It, it, was, it was totally like a movie. <laughs> and uh, later on, that person was not held responsible because they did not know that the punch was laced. Now, they tried to go after the people that laced the punch, though, because they created the whole problem, and it's almost like poisoning, correct? So that's something you have to look at. Now, involuntary intoxication includes voluntary ingest, uh, ingestion, meaning drinking or eating, injection or other forms of taking of any intoxicating liquor, drug, or other substance. <clears throat> Persons who are voluntarily intoxicated are still responsible for their actions, meaning that just because you get drunk, and you punch somebody that you're not going to be prosecuted. The section uh, that I'm looking at under 22 PC says no act committed by a person while in the state of, involuntary, of voluntary intoxication is less criminal by means of his or her having been in that condition. The evidence of voluntary intoxication is admissible solely on the issue of whether or not the defendant actually formed a required specific intent when charged with murder. This brings to mind another case that I have knowledge about. When I was in the police academy in 1978, back in the dinosaur days before the internet, uh, our, the person who was teaching one of the law parts was the, the head of the uh, public defender's office. He was the head public defender for the, the county. And we had a class that started at 8 o'clock. And he was uh, teaching. All of a sudden, he got a phone call. And he came in front of the class and basically said, I have to leave. I'm going to give you a real quick rendition of what I've just been told by the sheriff. It's going to be in the paper today, and we'll go from there. A sheriff's deputy had been drinking with a number of other guys at a place uh, called the Wagon Wheel, which was on San Pablo Dam Road at the time. It's long been demolished. 
I think there's actually a an RV sales place up in that area now, right near I-80. And the, the local police used to go there after graveyard shift, which they got off at 6, and they would drink, uh, have a couple drinks and go home. Well, one particular deputy, and I don't recall his name, got really, really intoxicated, got into a fight with a gentleman who was just a patron there at the bar, and the patron uh, whipped the hell out of him. And the officer crawled outside, and he got his off-duty gun, and he laid across the uh, back deck of his vehicle. And when the person came out of the, the bar, he shot and killed him. And the big question before the court at that time was the guy was so drunk, could he premeditate what he was doing, or was he delusional? They still could get him for second-degree murder or assault with a deadly weapon or manslaughter or what have you, but it wasn't going to be murder one because could he form the intent? And going back to his vehicle, the question was, was he armed also while he was in the bar, or did he go back to the car and pull his gun out because that would show that he had some capacity to realize where it was. And in that case, uh, he was charged, I believe, with second-degree murder. So just remember, there's no such plea as not guilty by reason of intoxication. When the crime charge involves general intent such as assault, battery, aggravated assault, kidnapping, or rape, the failure to act, such as involuntary manslaughter, child endangerment, or hit-and-run driving, voluntary intoxication is a moot issue. You can't use it as a defense. That's because there's no premeditation or forethought elements in the corpus delecti of general intent crimes. Hopefully you understand that. So specific intent crimes, you may be able to use it, as a defense, but general intent crimes you cannot. Examples would include that voluntary intoxication is no defense to a charge of assault, and that would be under Loera in 1991. And remember, the district attorney can use lesser included offenses to charge when the defendant is trying to use voluntary intoxication as a defense. This will include using voluntary manslaughter in lieu of murder, trespassing in lieu of burglary, Simple mayhem in lieu of aggravated mayhem. Simple battery in lieu of sexual battery. Child annoyance in lieu of lewd and lascivious acts with, with the child. Assault with a deadly weapon in lieu of assault with caustic chemicals. So you can see that the DA just takes a general intent crime that is lesser included of a specific intent crime and can use it to, to prosecute because voluntary intoxication is not admissible as a defense for general intent crimes. Again, if you look at PC 26, it gives you a good rundown on this. If you still have your um, criminal law textbook or you have the lectures from there, you might listen to the lecture on defenses. The next one is unconsciousness of act. Now, unconsciousness of act means that the person is not aware of their act. So the first thing that we looked at in voluntary intoxication was really an argument about whether or not the person could form intent. Now we're talking about whether or not the person knew that they committed an act. So these things don't come along very often, but let's talk about a couple of them. Unconsciousness of act includes cases where the person is involuntary intoxicated. So that student who went to the party, who drank the punch that was laced with the drugs, who went crazy and stabbed somebody, would be able to use this as a defense. Or it could be the effects of a disease, or delirium, or fever, head injury, or if the person's sleepwalking when they committed the crime, they're really not conscious of the fact that they're committing the crime. If the person has an epileptic seizure and thrashes around, and when they do that, they actually injure their infant and kill it, uh, they would not be responsible for their acts because they wouldn't be conscious of the acts that occurred. Please refer to the textbook for additional examples of unconsciousness of act. Next area I want to cover is ignorance or mistake of fact. And the definition is that persons who commit a criminal act out of ignorance of the law or mistake of fact can be judged not criminally responsible for their actions under PC 26. The case that I'm thinking about is the Hernandez case that we talk about in our basic law course. And in that case, Hernandez is having sex with a female in a car. Officer pulls up, uh, pulls them out of the car, and they find out that she's under 18 and he is charged with statutory rape. There's no question about voluntariness here. So she voluntarily had sex with him, but it's a question of the, but it's the question of the age that uh, was used to prosecute in this case. In the case, the defense of the defendant 
was that the female looked well over 18 and that a reasonable person in the same situation would have believed she was an adult. And in fact, in that case, he asked that the judge allow the jury to view the victim, and that was uh, refused, and the case got overturned for uh, failure to, to allow due process and uh, provide evidence that would have showed the defense of mistake of fact. You could check the textbook for other examples. One that, that uh, I'm looking at right now is May Mayberry, which is if the defendant has reasonable and bona fide belief that the victim had voluntary consented to sexual intercourse, then they can't be charged with forcible rape. There's a case called Simone in 89 that also says evidence of prior consensual sexual conduct between parties is relevant to our defendant's state of mind. Now, remember I talked about in statutory rape cases that my uh, style of investigating that was to simply do a pretext phone call where we would have the victim talk to the suspect in the case and see if the suspect would show uh, that he had knowledge that it was involuntary sexual intercourse. And if you could do that, that could be used against him later on in court. And, uh, you know, the secret test question is, is that admissible evidence if we're recording it? And the answer is what? Hey, the answer is you can use it because the victim in the case is giving you permission to record. So one side of the conversation uh, has to have permissiveness and the officer's using it to conduct an investigation. All of this would be much easier to understand if you again go to PC 26. Another one of the defenses is acting under threats or menace. The definition of this is that the capacity defense provides that a person is not criminally liable when acting under direct or immediate threat of death or great bodily injury. If someone kidnaps my young son and knows I'm an expert burglar, and they call me and they say, you need to either steal this diamond or we're going to kill your child. We're going to start sending body parts to you. I could, And this coerced me into committing the crime. I would have a defense of acting under threats or menace. So a quick review. The first common area of relevant evidence was motive. And the second that we just finished was capacity. The third is opportunity to commit a crime. Remembering the theory of transfer, the defendant's physical presence in or about a crime scene is relevant evidence. If we're able to show that they were there by fingerprints or footprints or DNA or a transfer of, uh, of specific fibers. Matter of fact, let me give you an example. I once handled a rape case where a woman was abducted in South Berkeley. She was taken to aquatic park and raped, and the suspects, so they couldn't be identified, had put a bag over her head. They repeatedly raped her, and about a week later, I saw what I thought was the car, stopped the car, pulled them over, and in the back of the car was a sleeping bag cover. And I took that cover, turned it inside out, and I could see some little marks on the inside, and we took it to the crime lab, and it turns out that the mascara that she used when she was blinking her eyes, actually she left traces of her mascara on the fiber of the bag. This was later on used to show that she had been in the vehicle. That would be relevant evidence. Physical presence can be proven by witness testimony, which would be direct evidence, or by physical evidence under the theory of transfer. Other areas in inferring opportunity to commit a crime include that the person had priorly uh, made threats against an individual, then all of a sudden they show up dead. Or special knowledge, you know, they know where the safe is in the house. They know what the burglary alarm system components are. They know knowledge of chemistry in a clandestine drug manufacturing lab. Or they know computer background and where certain things would be. Or they possess tools or other instrumentality, electronic equipment to bypass the alarm. Or they have a tow truck at their disposal that they're able to use or they have a nine millimeter gun and a nine millimeter was used in the case or special cutting tools or a variety of things that would show they would have opportunity. The best defense to opportunity to commit the crime is to have an alibi which is a Latin term for the word elsewhere and this is where you try to establish that you were not 
physically in the area and could have been able to commit the crime because you didn't have the opportunity. The fourth area of relevant evidence is threats or expressions of ill will by the accused. And this area includes verbal or written threats communicated to the victim or others, whether prior to, during, or after the crime was committed. The fifth is means for committing the crime, meaning the person uh, is in possession of the fruits of the crime or the instrumentality of the crime or contraband that relates to the crime. Also writings related to the crime. Example could be the introduction of lewd magazines and sexual paraphernalia were admissible in a child molestation case. Although the evidence may cast questions on the character of the defendant, the objects were nonetheless relevant as to the means to admit the crime and show how the assaults occurred because the person mimics some of what they saw in the magazines. What's the strongest evidence? It's still fingerprints. They're still the strongest evidence and are, are ordinarily sufficient by themselves to identify the perpetrator. And I mean that on stranger burglaries, stranger rapes, where people can't use an alibi of having been there before. Number six, physical evidence linking the defendant to the crime scene, including entire range of trace perishable other types of scientific evidence recovered under the theory of transfer. Remember, we talked about FICE, other evidence. Example of Figueroa case, after residential burglary, a portion of kitchen sliding glass window, which was a point of entry, was found in a nearby dumpster. Two palm prints matched the defendant. I had a case where the suspect in the case was a rapist. He'd just been out of jail for a few months, and he did not wear gloves when he would go in, and he would stalk women who he believed were alone, he would always pry a rear window and he would arm himself by going into drawers and finding a kitchen knife. And at the end of a series, we eventually actually had the suspect um, give up after we shot at him once in uh, the city of Albany. We chased him around about three in the morning. In one evening, he had been guilty of peeping into a house where a woman was in her nightgown washing dishes, but her German shepherd scared him away. But he was starting to disassemble glass vents associated with the rear door. After that, he went to a house and broke in, thinking that the woman was alone and actually ended up in a fight with her husband. And uh, from there, ran away again. And the third time where I got involved was in seeing a suspicious person trying to stop him. It turned out that it was our same rapist or temp rapist who had kidnapped a man tied him up, and held him for about six hours while we were in the neighborhoods looking for him. Now, this person left fingerprints everywhere, and that's how we made him on the case. The seventh common area where we use relevant evidence is to prove consciousness of guilt. This is an admission by conduct or implied admission, which involves conduct statements or other acts indicative of a person who has a guilty mind. So let's, let's talk about indicative. That means associated with or where we would interpret it as. I'll give you a simple example. I'm going to a silent burglary call, and I park my car a little ways away. I step out onto the street, and I see walking toward me one of my favorite burglars who I've, I've arrested numerous times. And when he sees me, he says, oh, shit, it's Ramos. And he turns around and starts walking the other way. And he just does this unconsciously, right? That would be consciousness of guilt. The person's trying to flee the area. The words that he said, were, he was surprised to see me, and it is an example of a consciousness of guilt. Here's some uh, of the examples given by the author. The suspect speeding away from the, the scene of a robbery in a vehicle, attempting to evade police pursuit, abandoning the vehicle, and fleeing on foot, foot is admissible as consciousness of guilt. A sex crime suspect fled the victim's house traveling a distance of two to three blocks across the neighbor's lawn through front and backyards over a three-foot backyard fence and through an eight-foot oleander bush. Attempted to avoid contact with police. In Callahan, it was swearing at an officer, verbal criticism of officer's actions and mere inter interruption of an officer's not physical resistance cannot be argued as consciousness of guilt. So there's one that shows that you have freedom of speech on the First Amendment. Refusing to provide personal physical evidence, failing to participate in performance tests like field sobriety tests, blowing into the handheld 
preliminary alcohol screening device or refusing to participate in a show up or a lineup or attempting to destroy or conceal evidence could all be relevant evidence to show consciousness of guilt. If you look in your lecture notes, you'll see that there are a number of different newspaper articles which are examples of consciousness of guilt situations. Having said all that, remember that the Fifth Amendment provides us with the right not to have to testify against ourselves. And because you don't take the stand, it can never be interpreted by the jury or the trier of fact as consciousness of guilt. The eighth area of common relevant evidence is admissions and confessions. An admission is a statement by accused which, it, which acknowledges a fact of relevant evidence in the case. For instance, I could say, yeah, I have a 9mm pistol, and the victim was killed with a 9mm pistol. I'm not saying I did it, but I'm saying that I might possess something that would show that I had the tools to do the job. A confession, on the other hand, is a statement by the accused where they acknowledge criminal uh, guilt. So the presentation of either admissions or confessions are relevant to a case. The ninth area is credibility issues involving a witness, either trying to impeach the statement of a witness because they have some sort of conflict of interest in the case. Um, you know, if you have somebody who is a jailhouse snitch, what are they getting for their information? Or if you have someone who has a motive as to why they would testify a certain way in a case, you want to bring that out, or if they have physical disabilities. And we're going to speak more to that later on in uh, chapter 7. The tenth area is hearsay evidence. We're going to have a whole lecture just on hearsay evidence. Definition of hearsay evidence is evidence of a statement that was made other than by a witness while testifying at a hearing. Examples of hearsay evidence could include admissions or confessions or spontaneous statements made by the defendant dying declarations, or reading out of business and official records forms. The 11th area is modus operandi, and modus operandi, or MO, is a unique signature or distinctive manner in which a criminal commits an offense. An example could be that I had a rape suspect in Berkeley who would case a building. Casing is where you do, like, scouting out to see how you would get in the easiest and he would use like one of these big Rambo knives to break in. And he would use duct tape to bind the victim. He would use condoms. He would wear a ski mask when he finally made contact with the victim. He wore gloves. So that was a very unique sort of MO that this guy used. And it later on, you know, basically led to his demise because I stopped him. He had a bag and he had his little party bag full of everything. And I was able to arrest him on an unrelated uh, charge other than the rape on actually burglary and lying to an officer and having an outstanding warrant and found all of this equipment that basically was his rape kit. And later on in court, we were able to convict him and charge him in other cases where we believe this was a suspect because of the unique signature that was used to commit the crime. We have to be very careful when we want to bring up a criminal's history or past convictions because they're not related to the case. The thought is that just because someone committed a theft doesn't mean that they committed a murder in the instant case. And there could be some time in between the other. Under the modus operandi rule, there must be some clear connection between the past offense and the current offense charged. This inference doesn't arise when the charged and uncharged offenses bear characteristics that may be of such common occurrence that numerous persons could have committed the past crime. The of crimes must be so unusual and distinctive as to be like a signature. In an arson case, evidence of uncharged fires in a defendant's neighborhood was admissible to show identity and in intent. The fire shared common features, same type and starting devices, materials used, time of the day, defendant's geographical, and um, the convenience that it would have been for him to be able to set these off. Each fire was started in a neighborhood where the, the person lived, the suspect lived, None occurred in those neighborhoods before the suspect moved to those neighborhoods. So that's in the Irving case in 1998. In domestic violence cases, evidence of previous calls for domestic violence or prior incidents of spousal assault are admissible to show intent, motive, plan, and identity in the strangulation death of a spouse 
in the Lincoln case in 1995. In People v. O.J. Simpson case, conduct evidence including a recorded 9-11 pass phone call alleging acts of vandalism, battery, and stalking were relevant to prove jealousy and motive in the formation of specific intent. Please refer to the textbook for other detailed examples that show propensity for committing crimes. In order to prepare for the exam associated with this chapter, make sure that you look at your chapter questions for review. There are, there are some that are listed in the back of your lecture notes to give you some help, and others that are listed in the back of the text uh, at each chapter, the back of each chapter. So let's give you a little help. Let's look at the lecture notes and the review question is, which of the following would not be an arguable area of relevant evidence? A, the defendant was under the influence of drugs and alcohol when they committed the murder. B, the defendant's hair was found at a rape crime scene. C, past acts of domestic violence in a spousal abuse case. D, refusal to waive Miranda White rights. And E, running from an officer resisting arrest. Bum, 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 bum. Bum 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 ba 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 bum 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 ba dum bum 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 bum. The answer is what? It's D. Refusing to waive Miranda rights. All the rest of it are relevant to the case. But remember, I said that we have Fifth Amendment. You can't even bring that into court. That that I took the Fifth because it's part of the Constitution. Let's look at the next one. Attempted escape from custody can be argued as what? A, consciousness of guilt. Best evidence is B. C, judicial notice. D, competent evidence. E, modus operandi. What do we say about running? It's consciousness of guilt. Next one, which of the following would not be a, a common area relevant evidence? A, motive. B, opportunity. C, reputation of family. D, method of operation. E, capacity. The answer would be C, if it was reputation of that individual for propensity to commit violence. Yeah, but if his uncle's, you know, a, a bad guy or a rapist or whatever, that has nothing to do with that individual. Next one, which of the following would not be a common area of capacity evidence? A, children under 14 years. B, self-defense. C, intoxication. D, insanity. E, unconscious of the act. Okay, I'm going to give you a little hint here. Remember, when we're dealing with capacity to commit crime, there's two elements that are that establish a crime, act and intent. If you look at these, one of them doesn't fit that. Matter of fact, one of them is saying, yeah, I did it, but I have an excuse for doing it. The other ones say, I didn't know it was wrong, so I don't have intent, or I didn't know that I committed the act, meaning that I was unconscious of the act. And the answer is... B, self-defense, because in self-defense, we're saying that's kind of called an assertive or affirmative defense. We're saying, oh, heck yeah, I shot the guy and killed him, but the guy was coming at me with a knife. The next question is, which of the following would not be argued as consciousness of guilt? A, fleeing from the crime scene. B, giving false name or information. C, refusing to provide physical or identification information. D, fleeing the jurisdiction. E, refusal to consent to a search warrant. The answer is, let's take these apart. A, fleeing from the crime scene. That's consciousness of guilt, right? Why would you run if you're not guilty? B, giving a false name or, or information. Again, why would you do that if you weren't guilty? C, refusing to provide evidence. If you're innocent, you're going to do that. D, fleeing the jurisdiction, jumping bail. Another evidence of consciousness of guilt. E, refusing to consent to a search you have the right under Fourth Amendment to, to not consent to a search, so that cannot be used against you in a court of law. Okay, that's it for this lecture, Lecture 6 on Relevancy. This is Professor Rick Ramos. Make sure that you're reading your textbook, checking your study questions, that you're completing your workbook assignments, because those are all going to help you with the testing. Remember that the matching quiz, you need to actually match it. Don't just consider what's in the workbook as being exact to what's on the test. They may be out of order, there may be some 
different uh, matching items that have been put in there. The workbook is a steady aid to prepare you so that you can get a high score on that. So keep that in mind. And we'll see you next time. Have a great day.